Uh, good morning, um, everybody. Welcome to the uh, second keynote uh, session for ICCE 2022. Okay. This morning, um, we have uh, Professor Dr. Sulwan Wong from the Faculty of Educational Studies, uh, University morning, Putra, Malaysia. Everybody. Welcome to the uh, second keynote session for ICCE. I think you have heard three times of the introduction. All right. So, um, please do welcome all of you to the second session of IC. To our speaker, Professor Dr. Wan Wong from, from Malaysia. Sun Wan Wong. My mentor for so many years, I'm so proud and happy. Um, she is an ex and teacher and has published more than 100 scholarly papers with special focus on learning. She has served as principal as editor of the Asia Pacific Educational Research Journal and as state editor of Research and Practice Technology Enhanced Learning Flagship Journal of Apps yeah. She was also the editor-in-chief of Botanica Journal of Social Sciences and Humanities In 2011, she has established a uh, special interest group um, DICAP or Development of Information and Communication Technology Asia Pacific Neighborhood under the auspices of EPSI to bridge the research gap between scholars from developing and developed countries. Her hard work and dedication to serving the research community have led to highly coveted association with EPSI as president for 2016 and 20. Translated into action. I'm going to share with you some empirical data uh, for this morning's uh, talk. But before doing that, I'd like to talk a little bit about IDC theory, since if you are not too familiar or if you are familiar. So, who are the people behind this theory? How far have we gone? And what kind of research has been conducted with, uh, in, in relation to this theory? Now, these are the people who first started on this theory. The key person is Tak Wai Chan. Unfortunately, he can't be here. I was hoping that he's going to be here and he could probably answer some of, my, some of the questions that will be posed this morning. But anyway, you can see that there are so many authors behind this theory. So the IDC theory, towards a theory of learning design for Asia in the 21st century, we have identified this paper as paper number one, IDC introduction. Well, from the names from on the papers, you can see that we have so many authors across the world. 
This group of people were brought together by Park White to share a common concern and interest on the learning education system, which is so much or very much into examination or examination driven uh, culture. We have had many meetings uh, in relation to ICT. We have talked about it, we have debated about it, we have had many workshops conducted, and our last meeting was held in Kenkeng 2019, and this was of course before the pandemic. And because of the pandemic, our work was halted a little bit. You can see the key person here again, Siki, Wendy, Ben, um, and so many more who met in 2019. Unfortunately, we are not able to meet here uh, due to uh, some uh, circumstances that the key people could not be here in Malaysia. From the first paper we published, we decided that because IDC theory has three main components or three main loops, the first interest, then we have the creation loop and has, and then the last loop, which is habit. We decided that it's important for us to write a paper for each of these loops. And the first author of this paper, Lin Xiang, who is here somewhere, I'm not sure if he's here yet, but followed by a smaller group of authors. So the big group of authors were divided, subdivided into three groups to write and to explain more about each of the loops. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the loops. So this paper, which is known as paper number two, interest loop paper published in 2020. IDT theory, interest and the interest loop, followed by the creation loop paper. But if you notice, wondering why is it 2019, which is paper number three, is because we sent three papers simultaneously in December, 2019, to the publisher and somehow the second paper got published first before the, the first one, the interest uh, loop paper. So this one led by Park Wai Chan, IDT theory, creation and the creation loop. So this is paper number three, the creation loop paper, followed by paper number four, habit loop. The lead author, Wen Li, and a group of people, including myself, we wrote this paper on habit and the habit loop. So you can see that from 2016 until 2020, we have had four papers. This was our main mode of determination, how we wanted to put across our ideas on IDC theory. Now, what we were concerned about, what was our main concern actually? We were concerned about the examination-driven culture. I believe this is a culture that exists in your country as well. It's a common culture where, you know, when you talk about examination-driven culture, there's this always twisted concept of learning. And what do you mean by twisted concept of learning? It means when you ask a student or you even ask the parents whether the students are learning, they would say that, yes, my daughter or son has taught 10 A plus. That would be what is learning to them. And for the students, they'd be striving for the number of A's which is what we know as twisted concept of learning, learning for the sake of learning. And you have this problem as well, learning fatigue. They learn for the sake of learning because they know that they have to complete this entire syllabus in order for them to probably ace the examination. And this creates unhappy life. It's very common to see two children who feel that it's a burden to be in school. It's, they are not, excited to be in school. I think when I talk to my daughter, she would she would be excited to go to school because she can meet her friends. And she would say, teacher, this teacher who teaches history is such a boring person. So that kind of expressions that you hear from the, ch the children who are going to school. So it's not a happy life for them throughout their schooling years, which is quite sad actually. And we know that Examination results are the sole deciding factor of future study. It sets the life or the future of this student. It defines the future of this student. If you don't score 10 A+, plus, you're not going to get a scholarship and you're not going to end up as a medical doctor. And that's the reality in, I mean, everywhere. 
And of course, we can't deny the fact that students have low interest in learning. And because of that, they have poor confidence in learning. So this, this was something that we were all very concerned about, which is the examination-driven culture. At the same time as educators, we are all educators, I'm sure you can relate to this, right? We are expected to nurture learners. What kind of learners are we talking about? We're talking about 21st century learners who are expected to have lifelong learning skills, complex problem-solving skills, good communication, able to think critical, critically, able to reflect and adaptability. They adapt, they're able to adapt. I'm sure during the pandemic, students were forced to be able to adapt, learning face-to-face -face and it changed overnight to being online. So the challenge now is, as educators, how do we challenge our learners? How do we inspire our students? We want to nurture students who are knowledge, who are knowledge creators. We don't want them to be only knowledge absorbers. So that's where we come into play, where we need to know how to design our learning activities. And knowing to design, how to design the learning activities, we have to know and understand how learners or how students learn. And that is how IDC comes into play. It's a learning design theory which is made up of three main components, like I mentioned before, interest, creation, habit. Well, what is it that we advocate for? Learning is enjoyable. We want learning to be enjoyable for our students. We do not want students to feel that it's a burden to be in class or they have to drag themselves out of the bed to come for the lesson or to attend the lessons. We want learning to be productive from them. We want our learners to be productive learners and are able to achieve their very best in whatever they, they are assigned or they are able to do. And that's the indicator of interest-driven creators. Now, when you look at this diagram here, when you talk about that a learning design theory, which means that the instructors or the educators, when they understand the crux of this theory. They design the learning activity or they design learning to align with the learner's interest. So that, that would pick or trigger the student's interest in whatever topic or concept that you want to teach or you want to share in the class. And from that, we develop the learning activity is developed as interest-driven creation activity which leads to that activity being incorporated into the daily routine of the students, which will form habits. So that's how the IDC theory works. Now, I'm gonna go into each of these loops very quickly. I know some of my friends told me, this, this looks like a donut to, to them, and I said, I agree. So this is the first donut or first interest loop. And the first component is triggering. Now, what is it that we want to trigger here? It is students' curiosity. The more curious our learners are, the more they want to learn. It means that there is a gap between what they know and what they want to know. We as educators and we as learning designers or instructors, we have to think of a way of triggering the student's interest arousing their curiosity, which then leads to immersing. We want them to be immersed in the learning activity that we design. And in this situation, when they are immersed in the learning activity, they reach a stage of what we call the flow stage. What is the flow stage? I'm sure many of us sometimes when we are so engrossed in doing some kind of work, you forget about time. The suspension of time, and you probably forget to eat as well. So that's what it means by flow state. The students are being immersed in the learning activity, which then goes to expanding. Expanding is characterized by meaningfulness. Students extend what they have learned and what they have acquired to make meaning or to make sense of what they have learned in the classroom. 
they are able to relate what they have acquired, the new knowledge, with the authentic learning environment. So this is the first interest loop. Then we go into creation. So once you have picked or you have created the student's interest, we want to be at this stage where students are able to create, to learn. So creation leads to learning. But how do students learn? Well, I think this is the most basic way of learning, you imitate. And that's not a bad thing to do, actually. There are certain things that it's good to imitate someone first before you actually do it on your own. So imitation allows students to absorb the existing knowledge by modeling. And who is the model? Probably most likely would be you as the educator or the school classroom teacher and so forth. And when they have this, when they reach the combining stage or where this is where they generate new ideas through a series of transformation and integration of existing concepts, where they integrate and they, they combine what they know and what they have learned to the next level where they are able to stage. Now, staging means that there's opportunities for them to showcase or to reveal, describe, and demonstrate their creation. One example of staging would be getting the students to present in the front, showing and sharing their ideas with their peers, receiving feedbacks from their friends, and also receiving comments from the class teacher, for example. That's the second loop, and we go to the last loop, which is habit. Cueing environment. The environmental cue. Now, what does it mean, actually? Well, I'll just put it in a very simple context, right? Well, if you are driving and you come to a traffic light, as you are approaching the traffic light, you see that the light has turned to orange. So that's a, that's a cue. The cue to slow down your car. So that's what we mean by environmental cue. And that's what we mean by arrangement of space or time. And that is what we mean by the first component of habit during environment. And when the activity is embedded into the student's routine on a daily basis, right? It goes into this stage which is called routine, where there is this repetitive pattern of activity. You do it over and over and over again, and you will reach a stage then would be harmony. Harmony is the outcome of habit. So it means that when students reach this stage, they have this, or they enjoy this sense of inner peace, they enjoy a sense of satisfaction. So when you have this habit, it becomes second nature to us. The whole idea of IDC theory is that we want to, to nurture habitual learning. They learn, and that learning becomes enjoyable to them. It doesn't become a burden to them, and they are satisfied. And that's what the whole idea of IDC. In order for us to create or to nurture interest-driven creators, just putting things into context here, the first loop, the interest loop, students learn with interest, and they are engaged in the learning environment, which then leads to creation where they imitate, they combine and they do or the stage where they're able to shape, showcase their creations, which leads to habit, which is undertaken as routine. Well, that's about the IDC theory, how this theory was formed, who are the people behind this theory and what are the main components of this theory? Now, the question is, how far have we gone since the first publication in 2014? Trajectory of IDC theory in Asian classrooms. I did a search on Scopus, Scopus database, using the keyword IDC theory, and there was 29 documents which I could find in the list. And out of the 29 papers, I went through and scrutinized it and discovered that 26 papers were actually related to IDC. The other three were not related to IDC. And out of these 26 papers, we have 15 conference papers published, presented in 
previous ICPE. 11 journal papers, which came from nine RIPTEL, that's our official journal, APSIS official journal, Research and Practice in Technology Enhanced Learning. We have one paper from Computers in Education and one Education and Information Technology. This is another journal. I'll just give you some examples of some papers that have been published. This paper by Masmida, Instilling Innovativeness, Building Character, and Enforcing Camaraderie Through Interest-Driven Challenge-Based Learning Approach. Now, her paper had designed some learning activities that was anchored on interest and creation loops. The course spanned 14 weeks. There was this bite-sized challenge activities where students extend the newly constructed knowledge from the activities to the final project. From her study, she found that by incorporating IDC into the learning activities, she was able to instill innovativeness, students were innovative, building character and enforcing camaraderie, which means that IDC is not only a theory which would actually increase or improve the learning outcome from the cognitive aspect, but it can build soft skills as well. So I was really intrigued by this research by Masmida. Another research that I had carried out with my student, Shuling Wong, relationship between interest and mathematics performance in a technology enhanced learning context in Malaysia. We wanted to find out when we actually infuse IDC into the learning environment, would there be a significant relationship between interest and students' mathematics performance? Our study found that there was no significant difference between these two variables, interest and students' performance. However, when we had categorized or we put the students into low achievers and high achievers, our study found that there was indeed a significant relationship between students' interest and mathematics performance among low achievers students, which I think is quite interesting here to show that students who are not so, you know, they're not so good in mathematics, when we use or we apply this IDC theory, it can increase or pick their interest in mathematics and that leads them to doing better. This study by two Turkish researchers who studied on the effect of computational thinking skill program design developed according to interest-driven creator theory on perspective teaching. Like I mentioned, IDC theory is a very young theory. It was just first published in 2016, and I was quite curious to know how many citations are there for IDC. And this is the information that I had retrieved from Scopus, effective from October 2022. There are 88 citations. Then there are many more actually after October, but this is the one that I have for today's uh, presentation. And our newest paper, Interest-Driven Creator Theory, Case Study of Embodiment in an Experimental School in Taiwan. This paper would be published in 2023 in Reptel. The lead author is Chiku Glory, followed by myself and Xu Xiong, Park Wai, Julie, Ben, and the rest. Well, this paper is very interesting. We started writing this paper. The idea was conceptualized in 2019, but it didn't really take off because everybody was so busy. Then after in 2020, early 2020, of course, pandemic 19 hit us. And that's where many of us were working from home. And we really said that we need to write this paper. So from 2020 until 2022, it took two years of our time to put everybody's thoughts together back and forth. And finally, we will be having this paper published in 2023. It's now with Springer. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not Springer. We've really moved from Springer to our own EPSI platform. So it will be published in Reptel. So this is going to be a really 
very interesting paper, which we have identified as paper number five, experimental school paper to be published in 2023. I had this good fortune where Takwai brought me, and you can see that Wen Li was also there, to this school in Taipei. It's the IDC experimental school. And that's how the learning set up. So we spent the whole day in the school observing the, the students, observing the, the teachers. When I spoke to the teachers, the teachers were very passionate about IDC. They understood the theory. And they were the ones who were implementing and designing the learning activity for their students. And you can see the students were really active in the classroom. They were chatting, they were talking. It was not a traditional classroom. So that captures some fundamental information about IDC. So let me check this time. Am I doing okay? All right. So 9.30. Number 25 minutes. What I'm going to show and share with you is IDC in action. This is the research that I had conducted with Masinda together with her. And we collected some empirical data. We had designed the learning activities based on the theory, but we had, with a very special focus on the first loop, which is interest. We know that we couldn't actually tackle the second and the third group. That would be too much. So we started, and this is our first step towards how IDC could be put into action or practice. Here's the course that we are teaching. So this course is a compulsory course for all education major students. It's where the students learn the fundamental of educational technology. 14 weeks made up of two hour lecture and a three hour laboratory session per week. For the lectures, what do they learn then? We teach them the concepts of educational technology. We teach them the theories, learning theories, and we also incorporated IDC theory, which means that we have actually incorporated this theory into our syllabus. We feel that our students who are future teachers have to know and have to have this fundamental knowledge about IDC. They learn about the development and practices in educational technology. They learn how to evaluate instructional medium. For the lab sessions, which is three hours per week, they have hands-on activities. They learn through projects. We give them some project work and this is where they acquire knowledge and skills to create instructional media. Every semester, we have different types of activities for the students. For this current semester, which is ongoing, we have required the students to create a board game. And that's how they acquire or they obtain knowledge and skills to create instructional media. So the board game is meant to be used in their future school. These are all student teachers, or we call them pre-service teachers. They will be sent or posted to school after they have graduated from our university. There were 64 students at that point of time majoring in education. They were in the fifth semester and they had no prior knowledge about educational technology. They were not having any information or background knowledge about information technology or technology. These were a group of students who were from the physical education program. And there was a little bit of students, quite a few of students from the um, Bachelor of Home Economics. This study was guided by two research questions. First one, what is the extent of students' interest in educational technology at the beginning of the discrete educational technology course? The second research question, how does students' interest in educational technology develop throughout the discrete educational technology course? Well, let me give you some instructional context in relation to IDC. Now, we had to understand, first, we have to understand the theory first, to know how students learn. And after we had done that, we then design our learning activity according to the three components. Like I said, 
for what I'm sharing with you, it's only focused on the interest loop. The first interest loop starts with triggering. For the course activity model after IDCC, we started before the semester started, we had formed a WhatsApp group with our respective students, which means that we were in contact with our students even before the first day of lecture. The first communication with the students was a day before we had the face-to-face -face class. I had informed the students that this is the website that you should be looking at. Please visit this website. The website is about educational technology. I gave them two YouTube videos about educational technology a day before I met them face-to-face. -face. For the immersion stage here, we picked this topic, which is Dale's Cone of Experience, and designed a learning activity. Well, in case if you are not familiar with Dale's Cone of Experience, this is my favorite topic actually to teach in the classroom. It's about the concept of abstract and concrete experience. What do you mean by abstract and what do you mean by concrete? For example, if you had, let's say, you landed at KLIA, our airport there, and you ask me, Tulon, how do I get to Indiana? And I say, okay, first you have to, okay, get, you get a car, you turn left, and after turning left, you go three kilometers and you turn right, and then you are on the highway for 28 minutes, and then you see the signboard, and that's an example of abstract experience. That is opposed to concrete experience, I jump in the car with you and I say, you drive. So you are driving that car leading to coming to Indiana. That would be a concrete experience. So this concept teaches students, what is the difference between abstract and concrete experience? Because as teachers, as, ed as educators, we, think we need to know, how do we actually deliver our content? Is it good to have all abstract information or is it good to have all concrete information? And the activity that we had designed, okay, thanks to Matida who came up with this idea, to draw a creature based on the text. And what creature was that? It is a narwhal. You know what's a narwhal? Yes? Some of you yes, some of you no, right? So some of you who say no, right, try to imagine how to draw and how would a narwhal look like? This is what we gave our students in class. The narwhal is the unicorn of the sea, a pale colored porpoise found in the Arctic coastal waters and rivers. Then we went to the next slide, more information. So we are giving more abstract information to our learners. Narwhal, these legendary animals have two teeth. In males, the more prominent tooth grows into a sort like spiral tusk up to 8.8 .8 feet long. The ivory tusk tooth grows right through the narwhal's upper lip and so forth. So can you imagine, right? So imagine that you're my student now and I ask you to draw the narwhals. This is what we mean by abstract information. It's so abstract that you need to think so deeply, you have to focus in order to try to imagine how it looks like just based on this information. And this is how a narwhal looks like. This is a concrete information. I have transferred the abstract into concrete. So after getting the students to draw the narwhals based on my abstract information, then I show them these concrete picture. We also showed them the video, National Geographic, for them to see how does this narwhal swim? How does it actually move about in the sea? That is immersion. Then we went into extending. We gave this question to our students. What else can you do to increase or concretize one's understanding about narwhals? We want our students to make meaning, to make sense of what they have experienced from the immersion stage into this, where they are able to apply the knowledge that they have learned into the authentic learning environment. When I say learning, which is authentic, it means that we are referring to students imagining, 
them being in the actual school when they graduate. So let's see the results and findings. We found that the students had poor initial interest. They didn't know much about educational technology. So I can't blame them because they are not technology-based students. They had no idea about the subject matter and could not relate to technology. These are some narratives or impressions that we collected from our students. So the data collection was carried out through students' reflection. They were writing the experiences on the blog. We also have some learning, uh, some drawing artifacts, and we also did some observations in the classroom. Now you look at this student number three, right? Male, physical education. I could not focus on the first day of class. I think this was because the subject was new and I needed more time to understand about it. The second student even had a more negative expression. I wasn't in the mood to study and felt blur. Blur means that I don't know what's going on. I'm feeling sleepy in the classroom. The class starts at eight o'clock. I hope I will enjoy the next class. Class, good luck to myself. That was the expression that I had from this particular student. We also got the students to draw. Well, some students don't like to write, right? We got them to draw. We said, why don't you draw? Expressing how you feel from week one to week five. What we got back, this artifact, this drawing, is that, well, that was, it wasn't that bad, actually. Students had, they felt that was just this happy atmosphere with some excitement. So you look at the drawing on the right-hand side, week one. Well, this student felt very excited. Week two claims to be in love with the class. I'm not sure if that's true. And then week three, they feel very lovely and very happy. Week four, feeling good. And week five, feel good, okay. The one on the left, you see that they're happy. The student is happy, learn many things. Um, they're excited about the new technology. They like Metaverse. Metaverse was an AR app that we had chosen uh, to teach the students how to use it. So cool classroom and enjoyable classroom. I'll show you and I explain to you why they think the classroom was cool. For the first component, triggering, there were two characteristics that emerged from the data, the qualitative data that we collected. Novelty and curiosity. Novelty of learning new knowledge. According to this student, during the course registration, this is a course that I had been waiting for. I was attracted to it when I saw the term technology. So this was something novel to the students. Technology, something that they're not, they're not familiar with. And I'm pretty sure I would be acquiring new and interesting knowledge. What I gathered in the first lecture met my expectations. I would be learning many new apps and passive in activities. So this is a male student from the physical education program. Now the novelty of being in a high-tech classroom, this is what I mean by being a cool classroom. Location also plays a role here. I really like learning in the PFC. PFC means, stands for Putra Future Classroom. During the opening ceremony, I think Matilda mentioned about this classroom in our, in our uh, faculty. So PFC is so comfortable and equipped with sophisticated ICT services. It makes me happy. Second student says, this female student, physical education, I feel the initial feeling of being in this class is joy. They were happy to be in the class. So novelty from knowing something new, novelty of being in the classroom location is also very important in this aspect. And this is how our Putra future classroom looks like, where students can be themselves. It's a very flexible learning environment. They don't have to be sitting at the tables and chairs. They, they don't have to be working on tables there. You can see that they are sitting on the floor, carpeted. They can sit on the sofa. Uh, the picture on the bottom here shows that the students were able to enjoy or to experience some um, AR and visual here, yeah, the goggles. So that actually made them excited to be in the class. The third novelty is novelty of social media app as a learning tool. Well, for them, learning tool, they, don't, they can't relate that to the use of social media apps. In Malaysia, social media apps, WhatsApp is a very popular app that we use. Everybody uses WhatsApp here. 
but probably in your country it could be line it could be something else telegram and so forth so when i use this whatsapp as part of my learning tool according to this student before the class started the course instructor used whatsapp to facilitate discussions among us not only that through the use of WhatsApp, we were able to learn about educational technology, which they felt that was something different from what they have experienced before. So this student said that I enjoyed it because I could experience firsthand the use of technology as a learning tool. So that's the third novel skill. The second characteristic that emerged was curiosity. Students were curious about learning a new subject. This student said that I felt very enthusiastic and eager to know more about educational technology when I was exposed to a blogging platform known as WordPress. We got them to learn how to use WordPress to blog about their experience throughout the semester. And that's where we captured the qualitative data for this study. I feel so excited to learn about educational technology. And I'm curious to learn more and how it benefits me in the next lesson. At the same time, we also found our students to be open to unfamiliar experience, something that they have never experienced before. But they were okay, they embraced it. According to this student, in the first lesson, I had a new experience. I was exposed to WordPress. I didn't know about it. They had no idea what is a WordPress. They didn't know what was a blog. But I learned that using WordPress is helpful to improve my writing skills in the blog. I could tell a story expressing my feelings about educational technology. Second student says that this was a new experience for her in preparing a lesson plan. This was another activity. I could use this experience in the future or when I become a teacher later. This experience is really useful to me. So meaning that whatever that they had experienced was unfamiliar to them. So that's triggering. For the next component, which is immersive, two characteristics also emerge, flow and attention. So if you actually look back at IDC theory, it does actually align with what we have found, aligns with IDC theory for the interest loop. So flow and tension, the students were seen to be deeply engaged in the learning activity. During the activity, when they were all drawing that now wall, no one was talking to one another. We were all drawing. Although it was a simple activity, it was just a drawing activity. We found that the students had to think hard as they wanted to draw an accurate picture of the teacher given the limited text explanation provided. It was a simple activity, but they were really thinking hard. They were all concentrating, giving attention to this activity. And what we found that the students did enjoy the learning activity. The students enjoyed the learning activity, although it was difficult. I thought it was very confusing, actually. So these are some of the pictures that we snapped while students were drawing. And after the students had completed the activity, you can see the picture at the bottom there, the boys. They were really happy to show me what they drew. And these are some of the pictures that they drew. And compare it to the actual picture of novels. And that's where everybody burst into laughter. They felt that it was a fun activity, although it was such a simple activity, and they could remember, even after one year, when I meet them again, they will remember this novels activity. So that was something we felt that we have to create some activity which students remember. And they remember that this novel is associated with Bale's cone of experience. So this student said, today's learning activity is based on our drawing skills and imagination. I told the students, don't worry about not knowing how to draw, just draw. It was not easy to draw the teacher and it was tougher than I thought. They thought it was so easy to draw novels, but when we had this activity, we were trying to comprehend how this novel looks like based on the information that I had given them. I tried my best to draw it without being able to see what the novel looks like. So I said, no handphones, don't use Google. I said, if you Google to see how novels look like, the activity is going to fail. I tried to imagine that it was an animal in the sea. It's really funny when we discovered that our drawings did not reflect the actual picture. 
everyone is laughing because of the hilarious drawing. Although we learn, laugh so much, we achieve the learning outcome for that day. So that was something that I felt happy that the activity was able to make them understand the concept of abstract and concrete. Now, the next characteristic that emerged was attention. So students devoted much attention to completing the Nawal drawing, right? And attention was sustained as the instructor showed them the actual photo. So I'm going to skip this slide. Students understood the concept, the important concepts of topic talk. And then we come to the last loop, which is extending. The extending loop is characterized by meaningfulness and relevancy, meaning that students were able to make sense of what they encountered in the written task by incorporating it with what they already learned earlier about the concept of abstractness and concreteness. So these students said that when we go through abstract experience, it's difficult to imagine what a novel looks like. When we see a photo of the novel, it gives a better representation of the novel through visual. The concrete experience is more effective for learning. The written task, students were able to comprehend how learning could be made more effective through sensory-based learning, learning by doing. And this is an example of what the students wrote. I have translated that, in my opinion, to strengthen one's understanding of novels. You can watch videos on YouTube. The students are able to explain to me how would they actually translate the idea from abstract to concrete by answering my question. So this is what we actually say that they were able to see the value of what they learned in the present context and also in the future. So meaning present context is what was happening in the classroom and also in the future, what would they actually be doing when they are in the real environment which is in school. Relevancy, students discern Dale's tone of experience. They were able to apply the newly acquired knowledge in an authentic learning situation. And they were able to associate what they had learned within the context of being a school teacher. That's relevancy. It's very relevant to them what they have learned, although they are not in school yet. So I'm going to skip this to narratives, but I want to emphasize on a new team that emerged. There was elements of confusion and wonder. Students understood the concept of abstractness and concreteness, but at the same time, we found that the students were confused. But they could still complete the activity. They could still draw the, creation, the creature to completion. So these components or these elements or these characteristics, which is confusion and wonder. So this is an example. The class today was quite inter interesting because we had an interesting activity to draw. No, it was not an ordinary drawing class, but we had to draw based on the textual description based, provided by our course in structure. It was a novel, an animal that looks like a dolphin, but with a cap on its head. I was very confused at first, and I couldn't understand the descriptions provided. However, I can say that I enjoyed the activity a lot. Second student said, feeling very confused at first and asked myself what the instructor was going to teach. I was not confident with what I do after the instructor experience is finally achieved. So what I can conclude here is that we as Instructors, educators, we need to understand how students learn. IDC is one theory that would be able to help us to understand how students learn. And when we understand how students learn, we then are able to design our learning activities. So in particularly for subjects that students have no prior knowledge in, or they find very uninteresting to themselves. In a way, the interest loop of IDC had to, some, had, to some extent, able to describe the development of students' interest, which means that we are validating that IDC work for our club. It is also worth to mention that worth harnessing the impact of confusion and wonder. This is not something that we planned. I didn't, we both didn't want our students to be confused in the learning activity, but somehow it did lead them to being confused and they were feeling really, you know, having to wonder, what does this novel look like? Well, if we harness the impact of confusion and wonder as a well-regulated confusion classroom activity, 
when we actually had these findings, I was thinking, I was trying to read more about is confusion a bad thing in your class? Well, to my surprise, actually, there's so much literature about having confusion in your class, and that's good for your lessons. But that's a caveat. Make it as a low stakes activity, meaning that it's not graded, right? So when we have this well-regulated confusion in the classroom activity, not only it can hold students' attention, but may very likely support deeper learning. And like I said, it's advisable to induce confusion in low stakes activities. So with that, thank you very much. I am on time. For, um, thank you so much for paying attention and listening to my um, talk this morning. And I'm going to hand over to Masida. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sulwan Wong, for the uh, very interesting uh, keynote speech. I think we have time for some questions, uh, but I would like to uh, read the first question that we get in the uh, from our online participant. It was from Percy. Percy, would you like to uh, read your question again? Yes. Hello. Good morning. So, uh, uh, good morning, Professor Wong. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, or, yeah, thank you for your inspiring. I mean, IDC, I mean, uh, there's a big potential for the metaverse education, especially the gamification of schooling in Asia, especially. Now, I have a, a, a big question in my mind. Uh, we, 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 we fought for, you know, the uh, innovative education, you know, for uh, decades. Now, uh, you know that uh, facing the open examination, uh, in the, especially in the Asian, countries and regions they're all the time the assessment usually and even the learning motivation they're all extrinsic that means what the student they they strike hard you know they, they, they seek the power tutoring and and they, they work hard you know for the uh gaining the exam bound knowledge and there's a lot of uh, thing uh in the past, previous uh, itc research most likely is in the primary and lower secondary levels and sometimes they are involving a lot of, you know, just like what you show a very excellent, you know, extraction of a, a new concept of IDC, I mean, in the teacher education. But most likely they are not in the upper secondary levels. Uh, in comparison, I, I work for, you know, the ID, IDDP, the IBDP, I, International Book Karate uh, DP for, for two decades. I find that there are some open uh, syllabuses, I mean, especially for open learning, uh, uh, knowledge creation. But within the exam bank syllabus, this is not easy as a uh, ICT uh, innovative educators like you, it's not easy to, you know, to make a breakthrough. So uh, could you share something about the IDC? I mean, this is a new trend of the uh, ICT education research paradigm. We really want to know any potential for, for a breakthrough, especially for the uh, upper secondary levels, uh, for, for the knowledge creation, using the interest, you know, the inducing student interest in your, I mean, uh, your international team. Uh, we really want to know uh, about uh, any breakthrough in upper secondary levels. Thank you so much, Professor Wall. Thank you, Professor. I think like what you mentioned that the examination driven culture is so entrenched in our education system. Well, the IDC theory is not out to challenge that examination driven culture because we know that that is how things are going to be for many, many years ahead. But at the same time, I believe that each of our Ministry of Education is working towards, you know, not really focusing too much on examination driven culture. But IDC theory is the whole idea of IDC theory, like I said, is not to challenge the examination-driven culture. It is working in tandem with this examination-driven culture. We know that it's something which probably is so difficult to change, but we want to make learning enjoyable, interesting to our students. And like you mentioned, you, you said that most of the, the studies, I agree with you that the studies, most of it is conducted in primary school. For my concept, from my perspective, I, I started off this, theory working with the university students. So I, I would be very interested uh, to know from you that, you know, you are working with a different group of students. So we haven't had uh, some results or findings that is from this group, which I think is the intermediary group of students. But to say that it's a breakthrough, I wouldn't dare to say it because it's such a new theory and it's a work in progress actually. And we're inviting many more people. So Percy, please come and join us in this group where we want to invite practitioners, researchers, people like you 
to bring this idea into wherever your learning context is and see how, whether it works, whether you can validate this theory because it's evolving. And like I said, from this study that I conducted, there was this new theme that I discovered, confusion and wonder. So maybe you will come up with something or you will discover something more than that. So it's, it's evolving in that sense. So from 2014 until now, it's, it's a very short time. So I don't think you know that uh, we can just claim that we have some breakthrough uh, discovery about it. But we want to try to inject or embed the idea that learning can be interesting and fun for the students. And at the same time, we know that the examination culture is there to stay for, we don't know in future, so how long. It may be there until you know I retire or you retire. But how do we actually make it more fun for our students and how do we engage our students? So from my study, I, I was able to make it fun and I was very pleased with that. And that validates the first loop of the interest. Thank you, Percy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dee. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this for the talk. It was very, very um I just have I, I know that this sort of takes a couple of steps, uh, maybe, I don't know if this is totally related to what you were trying to achieve, but I noticed that your, um, the, the students whom you had were, I think, like two service teachers. Um, did you have a look at how they, uh, and their teaching practice later on, did they uh, try to implement IDC theory in their own teaching practice? This group of students have not gone for the, uh, uh, teaching practice. So I think that's a good idea for us to follow up in that sense to see how they can extend uh, what they have actually acquired from our course. So thank you very much for that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sahana. Uh, thanks a lot, thank you, Luan, for sharing your experience in this talk. So my primary question was about assessment. I think that's weighing on all our minds, yeah. but uh, you already discussed that. So let me ask kind of a related question. Uh, so I can see, you know, doing this, say, with my master's and PhD students, where, again, this external constraints and exams are not hanging. And there's a lot of things we do in our among our uh, graduate students, which fits that. But when we go into the school classrooms and all, we need the buying of the teachers, right? Parents? Correct. Okay. So how, how does... How do we fit that in? Because the first, I mean, the one important thing is how do I complete my syllabus? One first thing that the teachers ask. Uh, then the parents and even the students, they want the good grades. So how do we bind in this culture of uh, example? Okay, thank you, Sahana, for that for that very relevant question. How to bind? That's the very important part. When we went to the Taipei school, right? We talked to the teachers, and the teachers said that they were given professional development training on the spot because they were not trained or they don't know much about IDC. So how do we buy in the teacher's ideas and how do we make them want to embrace this technology or this, um, this, this theory? So for us at UPM together with my colleagues, we decided that we have, we have this flexibility of deciding what are the topics and what are the theories that we want to infuse and to expose our students. And what we decided that we are going to be teaching about IDC theory. We've given time into our syllabus where all the instructors will be talking about IDC theory. So I think the, the way that we are trying to kind of like make our students believe in IDC. So it's true, we are teacher training uh, at the very beginning. So once they are believers of IDC, they embrace this IDC. We believe that that would translate into practice and action in the classroom. So, for example, for myself, right, I started off not knowing what IDC, and then when Pak Wai pulled me in into this group, and we started to talk about IDC and how we conceptualize this whole IDC theory. Then I said, I don't feel complete as an educator. I have to put that into practice, and we started to work with Masnida to design our learning activities to fit. How do we actually put or embed IDC into our learning activities? So that's the one way that I would recommend that to put that into the syllabus. But I'm not sure how it works in your university or your country, whether you have this liberty or freedom of deciding what kind of theories students are supposed to learn and so forth. But that was one way forward for us. Thank you, Sahana, for the question. 
Hi, Hi, Sulan. Hi, Sulan. Hi, Richard. I, I first want to say to, to say to you, you all, your all authors of IBC, that congratulations and appreciate your effort and your enthusiasm to, to change or to improve our current way of uh, teaching or learning in the school. But and you you say that the, you you use IBC the theory. I, I we we learned that IBC theory is working how it works very well. It's okay, but to me, to you uh, you claim you created new theory. I would like to want to to hear about the uh, considering a comparison with many existing learning and instructional theories and how you differentiate your theory out from the existing one, and how you uh, claim your theory better than the existing theory. I want to know the, your opinion of this. All right. about it. Thank you, uh, Richiro. Uh, first of all, it's a learning design theory, and we don't claim it to be better than the other theory. It's just that we feel that this theory would fit better in the Asia-Pacific context because of the examination-driven uh, culture. And that's when we actually got ideas from various uh, existing theories, so like the flow theory, um, we, there are many theories, and that we put it together. So like I said, it's a, it's a work in progress theory, and it's always evolving in that sense. And um, I wouldn't say that this is, in, uh, uh, what I would say, this is the best theory, or this is better than the other one, but we feel that this theory is, it fits into the current time, in Asia Pacific, and also where the examination uh, culture, given culture, is so entrenched into the society, it's difficult to, to change that, that paradigm, that mindset. So, yeah, correct. And and it, it's not that we, we prescribe that, oh, this is how you teach, or this is how you should do it. But our theory says that this is how the students learn. So we want our students to learn we pick their interest and we trigger their interest, and that's how it then forms from initial interest to creation and habit. So that's my answer to you, Richard. Theories, our scientists, I am. We are all scientists at the same time. Not the most important thing, but to convince people, if you create new thing, you have to convince people it is good. Good means you must ask that it's good, better, better than the existing one. If if a theory is not better than the existing one, there's no reason to use it. So you have convinced the other scientists. Correct. Right. right. So to convince people, that's why we have decided that we will then come up with this um, consortium of um, a group of people that we want to invite more people. So Richiro, please join us. You're not in the group, actually. <laughs> so, how do we convince people actually? By showing that we have some empirical data to show them that when this theory is translated into action or practice, I wouldn't say that it's a perfect theory. There's a lot of things that we need to iron out. But as we work into, you know, the next stage of the loops, I begin to see that it does work in my classroom. Um, it does make my students happy and excited to be in the classroom. So, of course, I think what we want our students not only to be able to achieve good grades and so forth, but the, the fun environment, being engaged in the learning environment um, is there for us to create for our students. But I agree with you that at the end, ultimately, we want to convince people, we must show that, of course, this theory is better than whatever existing theory, correct? But we haven't, I don't think we have reached that stage because we're still at a very early stage. Still inviting people like Percy, well, we would be interested to, to hear from you how you actually can put in your practice by embedding IDC theory uh, in the classroom. Thank you so much, Richiro. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, for uh, the Q&A session. I think uh, we have uh, off the time and uh, we are going to have a tea break after this. And then um, the next you know, session will begin at 10.20. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Sulwan Wong for the uh, presentation, for the keynote speech. I think many of us have benefited from uh, this uh, sharing session today. But uh, before that, we would like to deliver uh, some gifts uh, for our keynote.
Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Our next keynote uh, session will begin at 10.20. Um, and then I would like to remind everyone that uh, we have another keynote tomorrow morning, uh, which starts at 8 o'clock okay, for the last uh, day. And I would highly encourage you to join our keynote uh, session tomorrow morning uh, online if you are not able to be at this venue by 8 o'clock. Thank you so much.